to do that. Um, <laughs> how are you? Um, welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. We're very excited to have you all here tonight. Um, I see some new faces, which is very exciting. Every new person, we like everyone that comes here regularly, but we also like to have new guests, and we're really happy to see you. Um, I wanted to, my name is Leslie Bolin. I'm the interim director of the museum, and uh, I'm very excited to have Judith here tonight, and I'll introduce her in just a moment, but I wanted to do some just general business sort of things that we have to do, and the ones that have been here before know, um, because we're a nonprofit and for some organization type of thing, we have to fill out these sheets. So if you don't mind putting your name down and letting us know how you heard about the lecture, that would be great. Um, and I wanted to let you know also when you leave, we have a new brochure about the museum and we also have some postcards that you are welcome to take um, with uh, some of our models and things like that that are kind of fun. So um, we hope that you will take advantage of that. And we also have, our museum is supported by members uh, and uh, we are always looking for new members. So if you are interested, we have membership forms at the door and there are all kinds of benefits that come along other than getting to come to these fantastic lectures. It's really uh, a, a, a wonderful thing to belong to the museum. So first of all, I want to tell you, I'm, this is very exciting for me because we have a lot of interesting subjects at the museum. Um, and since I've been here for the last year, we've had, we've talked about uh, um, Let's see, underwater uh, prehistoric travel, uh, prehistoric transportation to, uh, we had a not tying, fantastic non tying demonstration. We've had all sorts of different uh, 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 lecture on the Arctic, lots of historical topics. And one day, I was sitting in the office, and this nice lady walked in and said, Hi, my name is Judith Ann Sachs. And we all went, Oh, really? Is that you? <laughs> and she just sort of went, uh, Yes, yes. And we knew her because we had seen her paintings hanging in the museum, and we're very lucky to have some of her signed prints here. And so we immediately started talking, and she and Haskell have come to visit on a number of occasions, and we chatted, and the more she came, I thought, this is just too fabulous for words. I'm going to ask her if she would consider talking to us and telling us about the series of paintings that she did, um, because they're so important and so interesting, and it's just, we're just very privileged to have um, Judith as a, one of our friends, because she does come in, and we're, we're just, we're thrilled to see her every time she comes to the museum. And so, she was just very gracious and said, oh, absolutely, and I thought, wow, this is just super, and we've had, um, obviously, it's brought us some new, new, new friends, and we're very thrilled about that, but more importantly, I want to welcome Judith and tell her how happy we are that she is going to tell us about her paintings. Before I, before I start, I, I'm sorry, before she starts, there are, there's one other thing that Judith did that was just incredible. Um, she produced some note cards for us that are um, a series, they're, they're one of each of the paintings and they are for sale in the back of the room over here and all of the proceeds go to the museum because she donated them. So another oh, incredible thing. Thank you. Thank you. thank you for your lovely introduction and I'm thrilled to be here at the Maritime Museum. I'm so proud of all the wonderful exhibits you have here, and, and uh, soon they will even build a new building out at the Port of Houston uh, to house all this. And that's very exciting also. I'm a, an artist who, among other things, loves to paint history. I was commissioned to paint a series of paintings portraying the history of the Port of Houston. I am fascinated by the history of the port because it's so important to Houston, and the story is a story of triumph, of dream and vision over the difficult reality of building a port. In the next hour, I'm going to share with you a brief history of the port of Houston through work I did as part of this commission. And I hope in the next hour, you will learn something about the history of the port, and you too will be inspired by its story. The Bicentennial Times, the official publication of the American Revolution Bicentennial Administration in Washington, D.C., describes this project as follows. The Port of Houston <coughs> Authority has commissioned six paintings tracing the history of the port at, whoops, uh, well, that was right. Uh, as an overgrown bow to its present uh, status as a bustling city of commerce, 
The project has the endorsement of the Houston Bicentennial Commission. The paintings are being executed by Houston artist Judy Sachs, well known for it, her adherence to artistic detail. When the series is completed, these paintings will be lithographed and made into a portfolio to be distributed to the public. As they are completed, the paintings will be reproduced on the Port Authority's monthly magazine. <coughs> this group of six paintings, one of them, National First Place in the American Heritage Contest, it was accepted in the Smithsonian Institution, it was accepted by President Jimmy Carter, and the Prince of Wales took it to his mother, the Queen, uh, on her, the occasion of her Silver Jubilee, and she put them in the library at Windsor Castle. <laughs> they have also been placed in various museums and historical organizations, including here at the Maritime Museum. Indeed, what an unlikely story for a port a meandering bow, 52 miles inland, filled with brush, logs, and alligators. <laughs> <laughs> to become a world-class port, first in the United States in waterborne tonnage, first in U.S. imports, first in U.S. exports, and second in overall tonnage. The, this fall, the Ship Channel celebrates 100 years as a leading deep water channel and one of Houston's most important assets. The road to deep water took enormous su public support and perseverance, and the investment paid off handsomely. The Houston metropolitan area has now surpassed New York City to become the nation's top exporting metropolitan area. Yeah. No great thing is accomplished without <coughs> partnership stated Janice Longoria, chairman of the Port Commission of the Port of Houston Authority. She says, the ship channel, the marine highway, has created enormous opportunity and prosperity for us all. It came into being because of great visionaries. Thanks to their vision and their partnership, Houston is going to be the, our nation's fourth largest city hosting America's largest and the world's second largest petroleum complex and is internationally recognized as the leading exporting area in the United States. Always keeping the dream of being a great port, determined visionary leaders have worked hard to make the dream come true, and it did. Will Rogers said, Houston dared to build a ditch and bring the sea to its door. <laughs> but how did this happen? New York promoters Augustus and John Kirby Allen tried to buy Galveston, <coughs> land in Galveston, but it was tied up in title disputes. Then James Morgan did not want to sell Morgan's Point and Harrisburg was tied up in a legal dispute with a will. So, the brothers looked farther up Buffalo Bow to where it interacted with White Oak Bow. No legal problems here. They thought, perfect. They advertised all over the United States. They were great promoters, claiming that Houston had a delightful climate. <laughs> it was a bustling city with a few hours of pleasant sailing to the bay for a seafood dinner. <laughs> but was it? <laughs> no. Actually, Houston was wild, an almost uninhabited wilderness with steaming mosquito-infested swamps, which they later drained. <laughs> the location was 12 to 15 miles by water uh, and six to eight miles by land further up Buffalo Bow from Harrisburg, who was an already existing port. The banks of these 12 to 15 miles were covered with dense gold and infested with alligators. Houston existed only on paper and in the minds of the Allen brothers. They had taken soundings 
from Harrisburg to the proposed site to determine the water's depth. Some months after the announcement of Houston, and many people said, you can't get there by sea. You will never, no one can ever get up here. The Allen brothers hired Captain Thomas Whit Grayson with the smallest steamboat they could find <laughs> to sail to Houston. People had questioned whether Houston was really navigable and from the Gulf. Well, since this was a promotional venture, there's the ad they had in the paper to come ride the Laura. It had a large number of newcomers, including the heroes from the Battle of San Jacinto, and prominent people such as judges and professional men with their ladies in fine clothes who made the trip as an excursion. It was an easy, pleasant trip to Harrisburg. But those 12 to 15 miles past Harrisburg took three long days. <laughs> As the passengers and the crew removed logs and obstructions from the bow while watching for those alligators. <laughs> Francis Lubbock was on board and later he became a Texas governor. But they were not getting to Houston as fast as he would wanted. So he went, and some friends who were also impatient, went ahead in a yawl. Not seeing Houston, they went up White Oak Bow. <laughs> <laughs> and they realized finally they'd missed it. And so they had to back down, they couldn't even turn around, they backed down. And when they found at the water's edge, which is now Main Street, a road, and some stakes and some footprints, they had found Houston. <laughs> Governor Lubbock wrote in his memoirs, he wasn't there when Columbus discovered America, but he sure was there when they discovered Houston. <laughs> <laughs> this first bicentennial <coughs> painting, the Laura, uh, shows the Laura docking at Allen's Landing with Captain Grayson uh, in the wheelhouse and Augustus Allen here on the shore with the two men tying the boat up and uh, John Kirby Allen here on the ship uh, he went on the trip and here are some ladies and gentlemen watching the boat dock uh, at Allen's Landing yeah. now up here is uh, Burnett's flag David Burnett was uh, president, interim president of the Republic of Texas and this was his flag during the time he was president. The United States flag had 25 stars uh, on it uh, from the time Arkansas came in until Michigan for one year, uh, until Michigan was uh, included in the Union. So the Laura arrived at Houston. Oh, the foliage is something that uh, was dense. And it was interesting too because here is a magnolia tree. Whoops. Here is a magnolia tree. And I wanted to paint it in full bloom with lots of blossoms because they're really pretty. But Bill Bossom from the Houston Arboretum said, no, not in January. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a cottonwood tree and a holly tree and some um, uh, uh, cattails down at the bottom and in the back might have been cypress trees. And this was used on the Junior League ball, uh, the Bow City ball, and this was on the Port of Houston magazine. This per that portrayed Houston's water transportation system in 1830, 1837. This is as the rail meets the sea. This scene takes place in 1870 as our nation approaches its centennial. You can notice that much of the trees and brush have been cleared away from the, except around the water's edge. This is the St. Clair. Uh, it's a large stern paddle wheel steamer that one that might go up and down the Mississippi River or travel along the coast taking cargo and passengers. And here's some passengers alighting, a lady getting into a carriage to leave, and here is some mules bringing cotton to load onto the Laura. 
Now, at this particular time, cotton was king. And Houston, at one time, actually became known as shipping more cotton uh, than any other place in the South. The brightly colored locomotive here is the General Sherman. It's on the trestle of a white oak bow. Now, let me make this clear. This was Sidney Sherman, and, and he was with Sam Houston uh, fighting for it, Texas independence. Not William Sherman, <laughs> who, the general who, who uh, went through the South during the Civil War. Uh, Sidney Sherman promoted the Buffalo Biobrasses and Colorado Railroad and brought the first uh, railroad uh, train to Texas. And this train is typical of what uh, would have gone over that trestle. Uh, through Joe Bart of, of uh, Southern Pacific and the Buffalo Biobrasses and Colorado Railroad became Southern Pacific, uh, I found George F. Wessels, a retired railroad executive, who was given upon his retirement a scale model of the Laura. And I went out to his home to look at the Laura. Uh, and I'd seen only black engines because when you look at movies on television, that's what they looked like when the movies were in black and white. <laughs> and so I made a comment, gee, this certainly is a brightly colored engine. And he laughed and he went and he pulled out a book and said, look through this book. And I looked through this book and every engine in the book was brightly colored. <laughs> so engines back then were apparently brightly colored. As, is this working? Oh, good. Oh. <clears throat> While I was there, I drew a picture of the Cindy Sherman, and over here, over here is a coal tender that would have been behind. It's not working. It's not working anymore. I can hear it. You can hear it. We can hear, but it's not going through the system anymore. Uh, this would be the world of uh, the uh, coal tender. The coal tender would be behind the engine. And should I? No, you're fine. We can't hear you. We can't hear it. They can't hear in the back. They can't hear in the back. Oh, uh, two minutes. Two hours. Okay. This is the uh, St. Clair. The ship is the St. Clair here. And the General Sherman. And behind the coal tender is a, a typical Wells Fargo boxcar. There's Sydney Sherman. <coughs> Do you want to go back a couple of slides because I think since we didn't have any sound back here, maybe that. Okay. Okay. We have a well, question too. Yes. It looks as though the boat was at a juncture, so that's at the juncture of. of White Oak Bow. Uh -huh. so and that's right the trestle is right. over White Oak Bow where the train is. Okay, so, that's, so that's still Allen's Landing right there. It's still Allen's Landing. Okay, yeah. right. I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Um, so this is the drawing I made it at uh, George Russell's home of his scale model of the General Sherman. And um, uh, before. Whoops. Before this is some sketches I made before I made the other drawing. I thought that might be interesting for you all to see how artists work. First, I made the sketches and made lots of notes, and then I did the drawing here, and then I did the painting. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, The next railroad company in Texas was the Houston and Texas Central, and at one point, Houston boasted of being where 17 rail lines met the sea. But much happened before the Houston Ship Channel came into existence. Men of foresight 
saw that Houston needed very much to compete with Galveston, who was a natural port. In 1821, the Houston Navigation District formed. In 1840, the Buffalo Bio Company was organized to collect funds to pay for clearing snags, limbs, and sunken ships that uh, were in the bow from Houston to Constitution Bend. Now the steamship Constitution, not old Ironsides, uh, had gone to Houston and could not turn around. So it backed down the bow till it came to old Harrisburg, at which point it was able to turn. And this became known as Constitution Bend. The Constitution Bend is where the Turning Basin is today, right outside Harrisburg. A second order allowed the city to pass wharf fees and build wharves to offset costs. And on June the 10th, 1841, officially created the Port of Houston. Sidney Sherman proposed that the state of Texas contribute funds to improve the bow. It did. And local businessmen were also asked to contribute. Between the state, the wharfage fees, and contributions, $50,000 was raised to improve Buffalo Bow to the Bay. Slowdowns caused by the Civil War did not devastate Houston, but it did slow it down a little. Railways went busted, and little money was spent to improve the Bow. Yet, in less than 40 years after the Laura had struggled up Buffalo Bow to a tent village on the prairie, Houston had become a thriving shipping <coughs> and trading center. Captain John Sturt and William Marsh Rice started the Houston Direct Navigation Company, which would allow ships to offload in Galveston Bay. That meant they put their goods directly on a barge and sent it to Houston and they bypassed those high Galveston port fees. <laughs> Other companies worked on clearing the channel so barges and steamers could pass more easily. However, Houston realized that the channel needed to be deeper and wider to accommodate more and larger boats and ships. After the Civil War, Colonel Brady orchestrated dredging the ship channel to, to get different uh, logs, plants, whatever, you know, so that ships could come up without so much problem. The Buffalo Bio Ship Channel Company chartered in 1870, and the city of Houston raised $130,000 to make the ship channel, channel navigable to a nine-foot depth. Ooh. Imagine nine feet. <laughs> the, the channel today is mostly at 45 feet. <laughs> oh, almost, we're almost finished stretching the uh, channel, but it, it will be totally 45 feet. It was stretched nine feet deep from the Gulf of Mexico to Houston <clears throat> and cut a channel by Morgan's Point and avoided Clopper's sandbar. Congress designated Houston officially as a port in 1870, and the first federal survey of the proposed Houston ch ship channel was made. In 1872, Congress allotted $10,000 to improve the ship channel from Constitution Bend to Galveston Bay. $10,000, not a large sum, but it was workable. It was too expensive to go all the way to Allen's Landing with all the curves in the bow. In those days, Galveston and Houston were great rivals. One day, Samson Heidelheimer brought six barges of salt to Houston, and it rained. <laughs> <laughs> Headlines in the Galveston news read, Houston at last, the saltwater port. <laughs> Heidelheimer furnished the salt and God Almighty furnished the water. <laughs> Local business leaders sent a steady stream of evidence to their representatives in Washington to prove the financial necessity of a ship channel, highlighting the many international customers who depended on 
Texas cotton. Tom Ball, for whom the community north of Houston is named, spent countless hours try, uh, trying to convince his congressional colleagues to support a deep water ship channel for Houston. In the mid-1897, the Harbor and Rivers Committee from Congress, chaired at that time by Colonel Henry Robert, of Robert's Rules and Order fame, visited Houston to determine final approval for a survey for the channel of Houston. But due to a major drought, Buffalo Bio was not much more than a teeny brook. Happily and fortunately for Houston, a winter front blew through. <laughs> And in with it a gully washer and a five foot surge that sent the bow over its back. <laughs> when the Washington dignitaries arrived, they saw a large bow <laughs> and lots of Houston hospitality. <laughs> the committee was impressed, and the engineers supported improvements to the channel with a little reservation. <laughs> After Tom Ball was elected to Congress he, and selected for the Harbors and Rivers Committee, the only committee he wanted to be on, uh, they had a new head, Theodore Burton, and he objected to enlarging the channel because he said it was possible, but not very practical. <laughs> However, Tom Ball persisted in trying to get money from Congress to widen and deepen the ship channel. Suddenly, Disaster. The arrival of the hurricane of 1900 it devastated Galveston. More than 6,000 lost their lives, and much of the island and its businesses were swept away. Although it was very unfortunate, it proved a need more than ever for a protected port 50 miles inland. Persistent Tom Ball persuaded members of the Harbors and Rivers Committee to override Mr. Burton. By 1904, work had been completed through Galveston and well into the second leg above Morgan's Point. But costs had risen. Again, expenses prevented going to Allen's Landing. Constitution Bend was designated as the turning basin. But by now, it was part of Houston and completed by 1908. More work was done on the channel to accommodate larger ships, and landowners generously donated rights of way and land along the ship channel. Coupled with the discovery of oil at Spindletop in 1901, and crops such as rice beginning to rival cotton as the dominant export crop, Houston's need for a ship channel grew, demanding a waterway with the capacity to handle newer and larger ships. Mayor Horace Rice, nephew of William Marsh Rice, wanted management of the port back in Houston's hands and got Tom Ball to head a committee to make a navigation district. First, the state had to create a special district then the people along the channel had to relinquish their authority and bonds had to be issued. Ball knew that Congress had bitten off more than it could chew in financing the channel, so he came up with a unique idea. Tom Ball proposed a revolutionary concept. He suggested that Houston share the cost with the federal government for dredging a deep water channel to Houston. Congressional Rivers and Harbors Committee Chairman then, D.S. Alexander, and the other congressional members were amazed at this bold proposal from Houston. They passed it immediately, unanimously, and this became known as the Houston Plan, and it is common practice today. The Harris County Ship Channel Navigation District was formed and launched to persuade voters to vote $1.25 million in bonds to pay for the district's share of the waterway. No campaign to date has been conducted more passionately and voters carried this measure 16 to 1. But the banks did
didn't like it particularly. They didn't make a commission, much of a commission, they made a little commission on the bonds. So they weren't in favor particularly of doing this. But in steps Jesse Jones, and he was a major force in the ship channel, and he went to all the banks. And within 24 hours, they all supported the bonds. <laughs> Everything fell into place. The ship channel was started in 1912 and completed September the 7th, 1914. Laborers took a keen interest in a similar precedent-setting maritime project of the time, the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway and the 51-mile-long Panama Canal. The dedication of the Houston Ship Channel, November the 10th, 1914. It was a big day for Houston at the end of the week-long deep water jubilee. This had been popular ever uh, from the beginning of the century. But this week-long Mardi gras light festival with floats, parades, bands, parties, had the crowning of King Retal. Houston, uh, water spelled backwards, and it was <laughs> not so old festival, which is Houston spelled backwards. <laughs> Forty blocks were strung with the new incandescent lights. Standing on the deck of the window, which was a revenue cutter, uh, was Governor Oscar B. Colquitt, Captain A.W. Grant and of the Battleship Texas, and Miss Sue Campbell, daughter of Mayor Ben Campbell, who pronounced these words. This was took place at the end of the Not So Old Festival. I christen the Port of Houston, and hither the boats of all nations may come and receive a hearty welcome. Miss Sue Campbell dropped white roses onto the water. The band struck up the Star Spangled Banner. The cannon fired. There was a 21-gun salute, and the cannon was fired by President Woodrow Wilson, who left a cabinet meeting in order to press a pearl button on his desk. <laughs> and he turned to his aide and said, did she fire? And the aide telegraphed Houston back, the ship channel is open. <laughs> In, in the, the huge crowd lining the banks of the ship channel cheered. <laughs> there were no big boats in the ship channel because World War I had started. The only boats there were small craft and yachts. And if those of you who are familiar with the yachts of today will see that the yachts of yesterday weren't as sleek. They were more tall and more boxy uh, than those today. <clears throat> this was the culmination of many years of hard work by a great number of unselfishly dedicated people. I interviewed Miss Sue Campbell, who was Miss George Woods when I met her. She lived in River Oaks. Uh, she furnished detailed and accurate information, which I have in a letter here, um, which was later verified from the photograph from James Thompson. I called her and asked to speak to Sue Campbell. There's no one here by that name. She said, oh, I said, oh, I mean Mrs. Woods. Oh, that's me. <laughs> she may not, she was in her 80s, and she may not have remembered her maiden name. She had been married to a Pilot before she was married to a Woods, but she did remember the dedication of the ship channel in perfect detail. It was wonderful. She said she was wearing a white silk crepe dress and a black velvet hat adorned with a bird of paradise feather. Oscar Colquitt was wearing top hat and uh, tails uh, with pinstriped trousers. This was known in their day as a morning suit. And Captain Grant was in full uniform. They were on the window. There were many other dignitaries placed uh, on the ship, dressed in their finest. 
Among those present were Governor-elect James E. Ferguson, Lieutenant Governor William P. Hobby Sr., father of our next uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, he was uh, William Hobby Jr., uh, Mayor Ben Campbell, uh, Captain B. H. Camden, Master of the Wyndham, used in the dedication, and the battleship Texas was too big for the ship channel, so it could not come in. Many other state and local officials. The multicolored flags flying from the mast of the Wyndham have special significance. When used singly, these flags have a special meaning, like inflammable material on board or not yet passed quarantine, etc. Many different meanings. But the flags, and there are some of them right there, but the flags in this picture spell 1914 Houston, Texas. Oh, you, know, you can either use them singly or put them together as well. Um, the, the flag at the top here is the flag of the Revenue Service. And uh, the fall following year, it became the Coast Guard, and the Wyndham's name was changed to the Comanche. It may be that the use of Miss Campbell's words in throwing white roses in the 1914 dedication may become a tradition for additions to the port. Miss Wood's granddaughter, Miss Susan Lee, reenacted use of those same words in flower throwing on the 50th anniversary of the Port of Houston. In 1974, at the dedication of the new Bayport Division, Commissioner Marcella Perry also spoke these words and threw yellow roses onto the newly opened channel. Here are some pictures uh, that I drew uh, from newspaper ads showing the uh, style of the times so that we would have the style right in the picture. And here's some pictures I drew, uh, my ideas of what to do with the band. A little boy uh, here is holding a Texas flag. And uh, when these first three panels were completed, <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry. When these first three paintings, can you hear me? Yeah. Is it working? When these first three paintings were completed, I requested to tell the story about them at Holly Hall. It was surprising how many residents of Holly Hall attended the dedication of the Turning Basin in 1914 at the not so old celebration at the Turning Basin. Yeah. Thus, amid the excitement of the not so old celebration, the Port of Houston was officially dedicated as the deep water port. Since then, the Port of Houston's has growth, his channel's growth has been phenomenal. The Houston Ship Channel has been recognized as a feat of civil engineering. But more importantly, it connects Houston to the world. World War II came and all commercial sailings were suspended. But war-related shipbuilding industries burst up along the ship channel such as Todd Shipyards and Brown and Root. The channel was also widened, straightened, and deepened. In May 1956, a strange-looking ship the Ideal X sailed and docked at the Port of Houston, its first port of call on its initial trip. And this picture is called the Container Revolution. This was the idea of Malcolm McLean, and there he is right there, uh, who owned one of the largest trucking enterprises in the United States. He wanted to speed up his trucking operation and reduce overall costs. 
He wanted to load his cargo into a cell. Oh, Somebody Yes, we 
don't know. I in the United States. He wanted to speed up his trucking operations and reduce overall costs. He wanted to put all his cargo in a sealed container, lock it, and ship it over water and then unload it onto either rail or truck and send it on its way. He, took, he had just bought Panatlantic uh, 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 lines, which was a uh, uh, shipping line and he put a, a deck on top of this T2 tanker of which he loaded 52 large boxes resembling the back of, of the cargo carrying portion of a freight truck and these boxes were indeed just that designed to be fastened to the trailer of a truck tractor semi-trailer combination the first container ship was an experiment by the newly acquired Pan-Atlantic shipping lines, later to re be renamed as Sealand. If he would load the container at the point of origin, ship it unopened to its final destination. The cranes were loaded on and off the ship by a crane uh, right here. And it could be lifted off the ship and put onto uh, a truck or a uh, truck rail or whatever. It was brilliant. And it worked. The idea turned out to be so practical that it revolutionized the shipping industry. Now containerization is a major part of shipping. The Port of Houston handles about 70% of all containerization in the Gulf of Mexico. And then we have this this truck. It ran at the Port of Houston and it carried containers and cargo around. And you wouldn't think it would have been such a difficult thing to find out about the truck, but it was. There were so many people alive that remembered it and they told me all about the truck. But there were no pictures of, or there was no truck at the port. And what people said contradicted each other. It wasn't the same thing. They, some remembered it this way and some remembered it that way. So it required quite a lot of extensive checking uh, to find out what it really looked like before I felt it was historically correct. After considerable research, Port employee called, uh, recalled that it was purchased from GMC in 1956. 
<laughs> Marshall Johnson requested photographs of 1956 trucks, and they were promptly sent to me. Okay. But they didn't fit the description of the truck. <laughs> D.R. Runkle, John Bryce, and others of the Superior Truck Company, a local agency, went over the matter carefully, and discussions led to Bob Evans of their parts department. The <coughs> parts department is where you go and buy parts for your car or your truck. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. Well, Mr. Evans said he worked three years before at the Port of Houston, and he remembered the truck clearly. I'll solve the mystery, he said. Here we are. <laughs> Catalog. The parts book did not contain a picture of the truck, but it did contain pictures of all the individual parts. Now he said, all you have to do is put it together. <laughs> it turned out it was a very special truck, a school bus chassis. It had no license plate and no cab. That's why it didn't fit the description of anything else. And it only went, worked at the port shipping car go and uh, equipment. And from these parts, I drew the truck. <laughs> then I took the painting back to Bob Evans and asked him if it was correct. We had the correct truck, even down to the right colors of each part. <laughs> from these small beginnings of 58 containers on a platform built above the tanks of a T2 tanker, container service had revolutionized the shipping business and helped make the Port of Houston a great port. You know why they went to the container? You know why they went to the container business? It's because almost 30 to 40 percent of the cargo was getting stolen by the longshoremen and just eliminated that theft. That, that, that. It actually didn't eliminate that. that. It wasn't quite that much theft, really, honest truth. Like when I sailed it. But it did eliminate the longshoremen who were packing each bag in the ship. Right. The longshoremen used to go in the hold and carry the cottons of shoes from Europe. And every time they came out for lunch, they wore another pair of shoes. <laughs> And all the scotch, all the scotch used to come in cartons, and boy, did we have some fun. <laughs> Eliminated the it all got done, you know, it was done at the factory. It really did. It, did. it changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. Good for it. Yeah. Yeah. How was it driven? Well, open cab. There's no cab on it. There's nothing over the man's head. But what happened to Sea Land? Sea Land Service Incorporated was a pioneering shipping and containerization company founded by the American entrepreneur uh, Malcolm McLean in 1960 out of his operations of Pan Atlantic Shipping Company, which McLean acquired in 1955. It existed under various changes of ownership, passing from R.J. Reynolds to CSX Corporation until it was split into two liner companies and a terminal operator. The International Liner Company and the Sealand name was acquired and formally incorporated into the operations of A.P. Mahler Moss Morris Group in December of 1999. The domestic liner company was sold by CSX in 2003, and in 2005 uh, it went public and now operates as Horizon Lines using a modified Sealand uh, logo. And I have just learned from Morris that it's planning to bring back back the Sea Land name in 2015. Oh my goodness. And uh, I told him this was very uh, 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 interesting because many things were happening in 2015, like the Panama Canal would be reopening and the Houston Ship Channel would be finished with its dredging. <coughs> the bicentennial year of the Port of Houston. In the midst of a busy dock scene, representative of the active 
activities of the Port of Houston, an imaginary red, white, and blue ship sails into the ship channel. <laughs> I named it that. <laughs> sailed up the Houston ship channel. And on its prow can be seen between the two ships that are docked at the port. And its flag flying up at the top is the Betsy Ross flag. And on its superstructure is the emblem on the flag of Bennington. And I also erected this uh, flagpole and put uh, uh, the United States flag and the flag of Bennington on it. Uh, the flag of Bennington is interesting because uh, one legend claims that the original Bennington flag was carried off the battlefield of the uh, Battle of Bennington by Nathaniel Fillmore. So it's also known as the Fillmore flag. And it's been passed down through the Fillmore family and was at one time in the possession of President Millard Fillmore, Nathaniel's grandson. On the left is an open dock. This is an open dock here. Uh, with typical cargo, steel, pipes, and containers. Steel, pipes, and containers. And this is a Ducumming truck. And it was actually down at the port. I painted this picture on top of the roof of the uh, port terminal building. I was there. And here is, uh, there's the uh, close-up of, uh, of the Betsy Ross flag and the flag of Bennington. And here we have the Ducumming truck. And it's taking on pipe and steel, uh, I think steel. And uh, at the back is the driver. His name was Clive Holmes. And he's in a red, white, and blue little cap. And in the front of the truck, and it's not shown in this picture, was the Liberty Bell was painted on the front of the truck. Uh, and I went out to a Ducumming uh, warehouse, uh, office warehouse, to ensure the accuracy of this truck. And I sat in front of the truck and painted it. <laughs> Near the containers in the front is a cowboy. Yeah, a uh, dr truck driver dressed up in a cowboy outfit down to the Stetson Hat. And you know, this is Texas. And he had to be in that picture. I saw him. He was actually there. <laughs> to the right, to the right uh, is a uh, shedded, a shedded uh, dock. And outside the shedded dock are crates and uh, barrels and uh, typical of what might also be inside the, the warehouse. And the uh, security guard there posed for me. Uh, oh, he's on a three-wheel vehicle. In the foreground is a field of blue bonnets, and these were actually there when I painted. I saw these blue bonnets. The skyline was actually in the background, and that's the skyline I saw. Absolutely. From the rooftop of the terminal point here. Oh, 76, 1976. Uh, that was the skyline of Houston. <coughs> Now, I picked one of those blue bonnets and took it home with me <laughs> so I could paint it. And, uh, I painted several pictures of blue bonnets, just single blue bonnets, before I did this uh, painting because uh, I wanted to get the flower structure correct and I also wanted to get the color right. Blue bonnets are different colors depending on the soil they grow in. And so this is the color these blue bonnets were in this soil. But you might find blue bonnets elsewhere that are either a darker blue or purple or whatever, depending on what's in the soil. Then down at the bottom here is a bicentennial fire plug. And there it is. And this was very typical of the fire plugs that were around Houston during the bicentennial year and also out at the port. The bicentennial painting of the port covers the ordinary, everyday activities. It was impossible to include such specialties 
It's the handling of oil, grain, uh, chemicals, etc., which each in themselves could require a, a complete uh, painting. The bicentennial year was one of great activity and progress at the Port of Houston. Over the horizon, our last picture, over the horizon blends the then present with the outlook of the future as I imagined it. Barbara's Cut Terminal, uh, the construction of which had just begun as I started my painting. Uh, and I painted it from the plans of Barbara's Cut Terminal. <laughs> they are. <laughs> uh, and with advice and research of people from the port who told me what they wanted it to look like. And this is what I had. It hadn't been built. Now, when I started this, uh, this was there, the U-shaped uh, concrete dock, and this tower here, which uh, uh, took in a, uh, by closed circuit television, it it, it had a, uh, took track of the uh, uh, activities of the ships going in and out of the port. And that was what was here, this was here, and they had just started building this. And now, uh, would you like to see? There it is today. <laughs> this is the U-shaped dock. This was the warehouse. This hadn't been even conceived of at that time. And I think my painting took in about this much wow. of the port. You can see how much it's expanded and grown. All of this and this. It's, uh, and here's a close-up view of it. Mm -hmm. Above, at the time of this painting, I found the Houston, whoops, went backwards. At the time of this pa painting, I found the Houston in the turning basin of the ship channel. It was an older ship, a container ship, and it was a sea land ship. But because it had the Houston name, I wanted it in the, the picture. So it says it carried containers. I put it out at Barbara's Cut Terminal where the containers were supposed to be. And uh, I had hoped that with the affection for the city's name, uh, Houston, that it would be around today. But I have to, tell, told, have to tell you, I have not been able to find out what happened to this particular ship. The Bar Marsk uh, has a ship named Houston, but it's not a container ship, and it was built in 1993. So I do not know what happened to the Houston, but it's here in the painting. Uh, Above the Houston is a typical container ship that might be in existence today. It's much, it's in the background, so it looks smaller, but it's much, much larger. And uh, even today, the ships are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the Port of Houston is stretching the channel to Galveston to a depth of 45 feet to accommodate these larger ships. Now with the planned opening in 2015 of the Panama Canal to accommodate even larger ships, the ships coming to Houston will be larger. The ship to the left of the Houston here is a uh, last ship. Now, last ship is a lighter. A last ship is a lighter means lighter aboard ship. A lighter being an unpowered barge. And this crane at the back, the yellow uh, structure at the back, is a crane, and it lifts the barges from the water, puts them on the ship. The ship takes it where it's supposed to go, and then the uh, crane will put it down into the water. Then a tug, it's unpowered, uh, a tug will come and pick it up and carry it to uh, where it goes. Now this is a tug waiting for a lighter or a barge to come down. And here's one pushing uh, the barge to a holding station to, before it goes to its final destination. Two percent, uh, tugs are very important in guiding ships through the ship channel. 
uh, they keep them from going in the wrong places and they just are very, very important to the safety of the ships. And one such company, Bay Houston Towing, has been in business since its founder, W.D. Hayden, uh, acquired his first steam tug in 1890. The Hayden family has taken a great interest in the port and the grandson, Doug Hayden, was a commissioner when my bicentennial project was uh, presented. This red ship between the Houston and the metal dock is a row row ship. That means roll on and roll off. Now, what happens here is the, the back of the ship is like this and it lets down to form a gangplank. And you can drive cargo on or you can drive it off or you can roll it on and you can roll it off. Typically, roll on, roll off. Oh. And uh, I was told this was the latest form of shipping which at that time it was. And I mentioned this to someone at the port, and they looked at me and said, hmm, hmm, uh, that type of ship was used in the war to transport troops. <laughs> so I guess it just got around to be using for uh, commercial purposes. And the contract for building this stock for rural ships was awarded the day my paintings were pre presented to the port commissioners. To the left of the radar, is a ship with a lot of foam underneath it. This was my vision of the new Sam Houston. It's a hydroplane skimming across the water, carrying lots and lots of passengers in it to see the port. Well, I had just taken a trip on the Sam Houston. It is in wonderful, excellent shape. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a marvelous uh, uh, boat. And at the time I painted this picture, it was commanded by Captain Shepard. It's now uh, has uh, Doug uh, Mims at its helm. Uh, if it takes about a hundred passengers on each trip or more, and it does it twice a day, Tuesday through Saturday. On Sunday, it takes it once a day. And any of you who have not taken a trip on the Sam Houston, it's free, and it's a wonderful trip. Uh, it goes. It goes seven miles or 45 minutes down, they serve you cokes and come back. And you get a, a tour of what's going on at the port. It's a wonderful thing to take uh, relatives to or people from out of town or, or just to go and see what the port is like. Uh, it, it's, you will find it interesting and a great way to entertain out of towners. To the right is the storage yard. Whoops. And here I am painting the uh, Sam Houston it was bought, uh, it was built by Placer Shipyards who also bought the painting. The, much help and advice about Barber's Cut Terminal was given me by George Altvader, Executive Director of the Port, Richard Leach, General Manager of Administration, David Walsh, Assistant Chief Engineer, C.G. Seaman, Manager of Barber's Cut and Bayport Terminal, and Vaughn Bryant of Public Relations. And by the way, uh, Bayport, Ter this is Barber's Cut Terminal uh, where you can see uh, the containers. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because uh, a container is measured by TEU or 20 foot equivalent units. And now they have even bigger containers that are FEU or 40 foot equivalent units. That's the volume of one 20 foot long container or the volume of one 40 foot long container. And here is uh, Bayport Terminal and this is very new. Uh, this is where the cruise ships dock and here's a con uh, container uh, uh, yard in the background. The Port of Houston has been called a candidate for the seven wonders of the world because of its unlikely beginnings and because its fight against many odds, political and by nature, to become a port at all, much less one of the outstanding ports of the world. And there is great promise for the next 100 years. The Panama Canal is undergoing an expansion to double its capacity. 
enabling for the second time in 100 years for the Panama Canal and the Houston Ship Channel to come together in confluence. With its location on the Gulf Coast and the sheer size and quality of its superstructure, the Port of Houston is the gateway to the heartland of America for distributing consumer goods, including prolific container imports from Asia. The expansion of the Panama Canal will likely mean more imports, more exports, more jobs, greater economic opportunity for our region and for Texas, says Thomas Corngay, chairman of Promote Houston Ship Channel 2014. The Houston Ship Channel, he continues, has shaped the economic and industrial landscape of our region for the past century, and there is no doubt that it will continue to do so for the next 100 years. On November the 10th, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson christened the Houston Ship Channel, inaugurating Houston's destiny as a marine industrial leader. The channel went on to become the driving force behind Houston's robust economy, ensuring its place as a key asset in the region's future. Throughout 2014, the Houston Ship Channel Centennial will celebrate the accomplishments of its first 100 years and set sail for another 100 years. And these lithographs, by the way, are in their time capsule. <coughs> Special thanks should go to Lisa Ashley, Director of the Corporate Communications at the Port, for her valuable information and pictures of the Port. Leslie Burke's Community Relations and Promote Houston Ship Channel 2014 at the Port and to the Maritime Museum, to Leslie Bowlin, Interim Director, Kristen Joswell, Director of Operations, and Lucia Cerritas, Collection Manager, for all of their wonderful help and for asking me to speak. For those of you interested in more history of the port, there are three books that are quite informative. Marion Sibley's book, Port of Houston, David Ballour's new book called Sheer Will, and the Images of America's book, The Port of Houston, and come back to hear Eric Young speak on the history of the port in November. And there's the picture I did of the USS Houston and of the uh, Stratford, which is in Robert Steamship Line Museum. And thank you for the lecture. other interruptions. Our guest is fine, I hope, and um, it's really, it's been really interesting and a lot of fun. I'm sure there are probably a lot of questions, so if you have a minute and can take some questions. Before we do that, though, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of oh, the Maritime Museum. You. We don't need to call 911 again, so. Um, but, uh, you had one picture with snow in it. How'd you find it? Well, that was the concrete. The sun was shining on the concrete. Oh, that's so I haven't seen snow in Houston for a long time. Yes. So when did you finish uh, all, all of the six pictures? It took me two years. I started in 75 and finished up two Beautiful. years. Thank you. There are five pictures up there. Is there a... There's one more on the table with a note card. Oh, okay. And the whole series. So. Yes. Um, well, I know that if you'd like to visit with Judith, she'll probably be here a little bit longer. And we just we have still a few refreshments left. Please feel free to stop in. Thank you. Around the museum. Thank you very much. I know. Well, that's why I had to get up. <laughs> Wasn't she good? I know. She's great. Yes. Thank you for coming. I just, yes. Well, I'm sure some of that history you grew up with too. That's it.